On the second night of this, which was the 15th night of the entire ordeal, Delilah called Harper. I think I'm going to die, she told her friend. Talk to me, Harper said. You have two minutes. I'm about to go on. Oh, sorry. One minute, 55 seconds. Talk. Delilah described what she was experiencing. You're having a panic attack. What's been going on lately? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Try me. But do it in a minute. Delilah gave Harper the abbreviated version of her 1.35am torture. Why are you making such a big deal out of it? So you're waking up at the same time every night? Just go back to sleep. You don't understand. Apparently not. Try again tomorrow. Harper hung up. When the stage called, that was that. Left on her own again, Delilah looked up panic attacks on her computer. She discovered a variety of suggestions for dealing with them. Deep breathing, muscle relaxation, deliberate focus, visualisation of a happy place. Delilah focused on the first two, and she managed to fall asleep, only to be awakened at 1.35am by the sound of her deadbolt being thrown back. Launching herself from her bed, she bounded through her apartment to stop her intruder, but no one was intruding. Her deadbolt was secure, and her panic returned. This brought her to the second prong of her sleep problem. Ella's nightly incursions into Delilah's sleep left Delilah feeling violated and petrified. She was literally quivering by the time whatever it was that woke her faded back into silence. She had to use the same deep breathing and muscle relaxation to get back to sleep, and they seemed to be losing effectiveness. But still Delilah tried. Lying on her back now, she counted her breaths in and out. She was up to 254 before she started feeling even a little drowsy. Somewhere around 273, she finally went back to sleep. So you think this doll is, what, haunting you? Harper asked. She sipped her espresso and flipped around her long high ponytail, which went well with the 50s style, full skirted floral dress she had on today. No, not haunted, Delilah said. She's not a ghost, she's not possessed or whatever. She's technology. I think she's got the de defective programming. And she's what? Invincible? Uh, so, uh, sorry, invisible? Got the keys to your deadbolt? Able to walk through walls? Harper threw up her hands and the multitude of bracelets around her thin wrists jangled. I mean, there's technology and then there's magic. What you're talking about goes a little beyond technology, don't you think? Especially for an old doll. Delilah frowned and shook her head. It infuriated her that Harper was bringing up the very point that Delilah was hung up on herself. Her theory didn't make sense, but what other theories were there? Have you looked into the meaning of the number itself? Harper asked. She looked over at the counter and winked at a cute guy ordering a latte. Returning her attention to Delilah, she said, Maybe your subconscious is trying to tell you something. You mean like the 333 thing? Harper shrugged. Every number has a meaning. A resonance. Uh-huh. For as long as Delilah had known Harper, she'd been a little out there. I'm a right-brained free spirit, Delilah, uh, Harper said the first time Delilah had laughed at one of Harper's spiritual flights of fancy. Deal with it. I'm not kidding. Let's see. Harper pulled her phone from her pocket and tapped it a few times. Okay, here it is. Oh, hey, this, this is interesting, she looked up. I don't care, Delilah said. Don't want to know. I don't believe in that stuff anyway. Harper shrugged. Whatever. It's your funeral. That night, deep breathing didn't help Delilah get to sleep. After an hour of lying in her bed, exhausted but still too panicked to sleep, she sat up, grabbed her pillow and her comforter, and went out to the living room. There, she curled up on the sofa, tucked the comforter around her, and was asleep in a few more breaths. She was asleep until something started crawling on the ceiling above her. Delilah's eyes sprang open. She clawed for her flashlight, pushed the button, and aimed it at the ceiling. Delilah fully expected to see Ella clinging to the ceiling over her head. She could even hear fingernails rasping against drywall. Oh, I hate that thought. <laughs> it makes me cringe to the, to the, the sound. Um, but nothing was there, nothing at all. Delilah shined the flashlight around all over the ceiling and she listened. Stiffening, she pointed her light at the corner of the ceiling where it sounded like something was scrabbling toward the wall. Delilah squinted as if doing so would help her see through the opaque structures of her apartment. Of course, squinting didn't help, and neither did sleeping on the sofa. 
The sofa didn't keep Ella from tugging Delilah from her sleep at 1.35am the next night either, but it did seem to help Delilah get back to sleep. It was only after the strange snicking sound retreated to the kitchen that Delilah was able to slow her breathing enough to find sleep again. The next night though, the sofa had nothing to offer her. First, it took her just as long to get to sleep on the sofa as it had been taking in her bed. Second, the sofa couldn't soothe her after she felt the light touch on her shoulder at 1.35am. This time Delilah was awakened. She didn't have to turn on a light when she woke up. She'd never turned the lights out. The fact that Delilah didn't see Ella as soon as Delilah opened her eyes gave Delilah a clue about just how advanced her nemesis was. Ella could disappear in the blink, or the opening of an eye. Delilah knew Ella had disappeared that fast because the doll had been there. She, just, she had to have been there. Something touched Delilah. The touch had been baby soft, Ella soft, little fingers, just a hint of a brush against Delilah's nightshirt covered shoulder. No more than a hint of contact. But it had been enough to turn Delilah's intestines into a tangled mess, mass of fear and transform her blood into liquid nitrogen. She felt like she was being frozen and broken apart from within. Delilah stood, clenching her comforter and her pillow. She couldn't stay out here in the living room. She looked around like a gazelle, searching for a place the lion couldn't reach. Her gaze landed on the bathroom door. She ran for the little room and dove, uh, sorry, and dove <laughs> with her comforter and pillow into the bathtub. Curling into the tightest ball she could manage, she pulled the comforter over her head. What is a comforter? Is it a blanket? I don't know if it's like an American word. Like pacifier is, I know is like dummy and British, but it's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> the next night, Delilah started in the bathtub and still Ella found her. At 1.35am, Delilah heard something creeping through the pipes under the tub. Sure, Ella's hand was going to bust through the porcelain and grab her, Delilah had scrambled out of the tub and into the corner of the bathroom, against the door, where she spent the next four hours trying to breathe. She didn't even attempt sleep. At 5.35am, Delilah got dressed and went over to the diner. Nate, as she knew he would be, was baking biscuits and cinnamon rolls. What are you doing here? he asked when she stepped into the kitchen. I thought putting you on the same shift all the time had eliminated your time confusion. Now you're showing up for shifts you're not even you're not on instead of being late for the ones you are on. Nate chopped biscuit dough into neat squares and began throwing them into perfectly straight lines on a massive, massive baking sheet. The diner smelled gloriously ordinary. Coffee aromas mingled with the scents of buttermilk and cinnamon. The sounds were comforting were comfortingly normal too. A couple of their early regulars were discussing the weather at the counter. One of the servers was whistling. The walk-in refrigerator hummed. I need you to put me on nights, Delilah said to Nate. Nate stopped in mid-throw. He turned and raised both eyebrows. You messing with me? Delilah shook her head. I'm having trouble sleeping at night. It's, well, it's a thing. I figure if I work nights, I can sleep during the day. I know Grace hates managing the night shift. She'd be happy to trade with me, I'm sure. You're a better manager. I like having you here when it's busy. Thanks. That wasn't a compliment. It was a statement of fact and, and a compliment. Uh, and a com <laughs> it wasn't a compliment. It was a compliment uh, and a complaint. You're just a teddy bear under all that bluster, Delilah said. It was true. Nate complained about every employee and every customer in the diner in general, and he loved them all. You tell anyone and I'll have to kill you. Delilah mimed, zipping her mouth shut. Nate sighed. Okay, switch. But do what you can to work out the thing. Thanks. Be here at 10 and do not be late. I'm going to buy two new alarm clocks right now. Good girl. <laughs> this can only go downward, <laughs> you know, if she's awake when the alarm goes off. Oh no. Delilah didn't know why she didn't think of it before. How could Ella plague Delilah at 1.35am if Delilah was already awake at that time? Exactly. There was no way Ella could sneak up on Delilah at the restaurant, so all Delilah had to do was work nights until Ella ran out of juice or whatever. Problem solved. Even though Delilah had never liked the night shift when she'd worked it before, she was so buoyed by her plan to be free of Ella 
that she went to work in the best mood she'd been in for a long time. She was so upbeat when she clocked in at 9.55pm that Glenn, the night shift cook, asked her if she was alright. Freedom, Glenn, she said. This is what freedom looks like. Weird is what you look like, he said. But he grinned to let her know he didn't hold it against her. Glenn was a huge guy with a gut that sometimes caught fire when he hung it over the grill. It spite of, in spite of his size, he was energetic. She thought he was pretty young, maybe in his late 20s. He had a baby face, chin-length sideburns and kind brown eyes. She liked working with him. For 3 hours and 39 minutes, Delilah felt great. She chatted with all the late-night regulars, letting a couple of the old guys flirt with her. She didn't even mind the couples, the ones who came in after the late shows, the ones who used to make her feel desperately alone. At 1.34am, Delilah stepped into the walk-in refrigerator to grab some cheese and some lettuce. For some reason, salads were popular tonight. She was just bending over to reach for the cheddar when she heard an alarm going off in the kitchen. Rising up, she whacked her head on the shelf above her. Uh, she ignored the pain and looked at her watch. It was 1.35am. Tearing out of the walk-in, Delilah spun in a circle in the kitchen. Where's that coming from? She shouted. Glenn looked up from the grill. Jackie, the night server, dropped a plate and stared at Delilah with wide blue eyes. Where's that coming from? Glenn asked. That! The alarm was similar to the torture device that Gerald had used. It had that same ringing, buzzing, shrieking undulation. <laughs> undulation. Uh, Delilah ran to the deep fryer and looked at its controls. No, it wasn't going off. She checked the ovens. They weren't even being used. She tore into the employee break room. No, the sound wasn't coming from in there. It was out in the kitchen. Delilah returned to the middle of the stainless steel maze and began searching through pots, pans and utensils. She didn't do it neatly or methodically, and when she tossed her third pan, Glenn grabbed her arm. Hey, Lady Delilah, you tripping? What? Delilah rested her arm from Glenn's grasp. No, don't you hear? The sound stopped. Delilah tilted her head and listened, but all she could hear now were the normal diner vo uh, noises. She looked at Glenn and at Jackie, who was still staring like Delilah had just turned into an elephant. You two didn't hear that? She asked. Heard you shouting and throwing pans around, Glenn said. Delilah looked at Jackie. A year or two younger than Delilah and still unsure of herself, Jackie wore bright blue glasses. The lenses made her eyes look huge with shock. Jackie shook her head. I didn't hear anything. I mean, um, other than um, you and the usual um, stuff. This couldn't be happening. How could Ella have followed Delilah over here? Well, why couldn't she follow Delilah over here? Hadn't Ella already demonstrated she could do pretty much whatever she wanted? Which was crazy. This was just technology gone awry, right? You gonna be okay? Glenn asked. Delilah shook her head. Yeah. And she figured she would be. At least she didn't have to try to go to sleep with her heart pounding so loudly she was sure Glenn and Jackie could hear it and were just being too polite to say so. So her plan hadn't worked, but the upside was she could use her adrenaline-driven energy surge for her work instead of trying to fight it so she could go to sleep. And maybe tomorrow night, because she was prepared for the alarm sound now, she could ignore it and get on with her shift. Maybe her new plan would work after all. On the second night shift, Delilah made sure she wasn't alone at 1.35am. She stuck close to Glenn, which he didn't seem to mind, but in spite of being with him, she still lost it. She couldn't help it. Tonight, for the first time, she hadn't just heard or sensed anything. Uh, sorry, she hadn't just heard or sensed something. She'd seen something. She'd seen a flash of bright blue in the walk-in when Jackie opened the door. When she saw what she was sure was Ella coming out of the walk-in, Delilah screamed and pressed against Glenn. He didn't seem to mind that either, but he did ask why she was screaming. She had no answer for him. At 1.30am, the third night of Delilah's switch to night shift, Delilah was behind the counter. She had decided the way to make sure nothing spooked her tonight was to stay out here in the open, well away from the walk-in. When Mrs. Jeffrey, the rice pudding regular, came into the diner, Delilah was thrilled. She could serve Mrs. Jeffrey in 1.35am would just go on by. 
Hi Delilah. Mrs. Jeffrey took a seat on one of the swiveling padded counter stools. Her eyes were puffy. Delilah leaned in on the counter. Hi Mrs. Jeffrey. Having trouble sleeping? Mrs. Jeffrey patted her ta uh, tussled hair. I suppose it's obvious. I do hope you still have some rice pudding left. Absolutely, I'll just... Delilah stopped. She looked over her shoulder. Then she glanced at the clock. It was 1.33am. Where was Jackie? No way did Delilah want to go back into the walk-in. She was sure Ella would be, waiting, uh, would be in there waiting for her. Jackie? She called. No answer. Jackie! It came out as a bellow. Glenn stu stuck his head out of the kitchen. Is there a problem? Delilah tried to calm her breathing. She was building up to a full-blown anxiety attack and she didn't want to have one of those in front of her customer and co-workers. Delilah looked at Mrs. Jeffrey. The elderly woman's brown eyes were wide. Sorry, Delilah said. It's just... She stopped when the counter stool next to Mrs. Jeffrey started spinning back and forth. She blinked and she realised Ella was on the stool. Ella was playing on the stool. Stop it! Delilah clampered over the counter and grabbed the stool. That's when Jackie entered the dining room. Delilah glanced at Jackie and realised she was sprawled over the counter, her butt up in the air. No wonder Jackie was gawking at her, open-mouthed. Are you alright, dear? Mrs. Jeffrey asked. Delilah slid off the counter. You didn't see the doll on the stool? Doll? That's my purse, dear. Mrs. Jeffrey patted a bright blue purse, which sat on the stool next to her. Delilah backed away from the counter. She checked the clock. Of course, it was 1.35am. The next night, something similar happened. Delilah stayed in the dining room, but she was still traumatised at 1.35am, when she saw something moving around in the trash bin under the counter. Wanting to believe it was a mouse, um, even though that would have been horrible for the diner, she'd used a fork to search the rubbish. She didn't find a mouse, but she spotted a pink ruffle that made her drop the fork and jump back. She had resisted the urge to scream, but she hadn't been able to resist the urge to hurl the trash bin out the back door of the diner, scattering trash but no Ella, who, as usual, had instantly moved on, all over the pavement. Delilah just couldn't contain her reactions. She knew Glenn and Jackie were watching her, but that wasn't enough to keep her calm. It was the fifth night of night, of night shift uh, that did Delilah in. Even though it hadn't worked so well yet, Delilah still thought the safest place for her in the diner was the main dining room. She did her best to avoid closed-in places like the walk-in, the supply room and Nate's office. At 1.30am on the fifth night, the diner was empty of customers. Delilah and Jackie were filling the small glass salt and pepper containers. Delilah had salt, Jackie had paper. They had the tray of containers set up at a table by the diner's front window and they sat on opposite sides of the table. While they worked, Jackie chatted about her college classes. Delilah tried to pay attention but she was mentally counting down the minutes and seconds to 1.35am. What was it going to be tonight? Every muscle and joint in Delilah's body was stiff with dread, but when Delilah spotted something bright blue flutter through the parking lot in front of the diner, her muscles and joints released and went into action. She jumped up, knocking the tray of salt and pepper shakers onto the floor with a loud crash, and she sprinted out the diner's front door. Rushing through the nearly empty parking lot, she scanned for Ella's dress. She was sure that that was what she had seen. She had seen the trailing edge of Ella's fluffy dress. The doll was out here. She had been watching Delilah. When she didn't see Ella, Delilah started looking under the two parked cars at the edge of the lot. She was bending to check under the first one when someone grabbed her shoulder. She screamed. Okay, okay, you're okay. It was Glenn. His face looked pale in the mottled light. Did you see her? Delilah asked. See who? She looked into Glenn's eyes. He was so sympathetic and concerned. Delilah crumpled into Glenn's arms and started to cry. Delilah thought it was pretty amazing she'd gotten through 23 nights of 1.35am horror without crying. In fact, she hadn't even noticed that she didn't cry. But once she started crying, she couldn't stop. She cried so much that after Glenn got her inside, he called Nate and asked him to come in. Nate arrived as Jackie was sweeping up broken glass from the diner floor. While Delilah sat in the back booth and tried to get her body to stop twitching, Nate talked to Glenn and Jackie. She couldn't hear what they said, but she figured 
she should say something on her own behalf. She stood. Come with me, Nate stood, uh, said. Good, he was taking her to his office. She could explain things there, or not. As soon as they entered his office, Nate closed the door behind him. I'm sorry, Delilah, I have to let you go. Delilah looked at Nate with wide eyes that felt bruised and lacerated. Don't look at me like that. Nate went around his desk and dropped into his leather chair. Delilah twisted her mouth and tried not to whimper. I've cut you all kinds of slack for being late. I've worked around your thing, but this is too much. Jackie says you've been acting super weird. He gave the words, air quotes, the last four nights. And now this. I can't keep an employee who freaks out the customers and breaks trays full of salt and pepper shakers. Nate, I don't, don't even try to give me a sob story. I'm not your father. Whatever you have going on that made, okay, oh, that made you do what you did tonight is something you need to work on on your own. Outside this diner. You're a good worker when you're here and focused, but I can't afford the liability risks of you acting like this. He rubbed his beard. I'll have someone bring you your last check tomorrow. Delilah stood in front of Nate's scarred old desk and looked at it, at all its neat little piles. She turned. She wasn't going to beg for the job. As she left the diner, she wasn't even thinking about the job. She was thinking about Ella. Every night was getting worse. How was she going to get through another 1.35 a.m.? Sheesh. <clears throat> when Richard had asked Delilah to move out of his parents' guest house, she'd had no place to go, so she'd gone to Harper. Harper welcomed her with open arms, but unfortunately Harper lived in a house with ten other struggling actors. All Harper had to offer was half of a double-sized bed mattress on the floor of what once was a massive walk-in closet. Massive for a closet, not so much for a place to sleep. Harper loved her retreat. She got the bed and she got to organise all her clothes on the racks and shelves of the closet. Delilah ha hated the tiny space. It gave her claustrophobia. Plus, Harper snored and talked in her sleep. Delilah had only stayed with Harper three days before getting her apartment with the money Richard had given her, so it had said a lot about her state of mind that she called Harper when she got home from work and asked if she could stay with Harper for a few nights. Sure thing, Harper said. We'll have a slumber party. You won't even know 1.35am has come and gone. Delilah wanted to believe that was true. She tried to believe it. Harper was performing that evening, as she did six evenings a week. So she left uh, Delilah in the care of one of her, flat, of her housemates, a funky guy named Rudolph, who, <laughs> who had a red nose, who spent the afternoon and evening teaching Delilah the card game he created. She never did fully understand it, but she had to admit it was entertaining. Rudolph was funny and nice too. By the time Harper got home at about 12.30am, Delilah was surprisingly relaxed. Okay, Harper said dragging Delilah away from a disappointed Rudolph. You don't get to keep her as a pet, Rudy. She chastised. <laughs> um, he stuck out his lower lip and then grinned at Delilah as Delilah followed Harper to the second floor of his house. I have munchies, Harper said. The salty kind, guaranteed to keep away snarky high-tech dolls. Delilah's stomach did a somersault at the, wor at the word doll. Harper led Delilah into a bedroom, threw several bags of boxes of chips and crackers on the mattress, then said, I need to go wash off the face paint. Be right back. Delilah sat on the mattress, opened a box of cheese crackers and nibbled on one. Her stomach continued to do gymnastics. When Harper returned, she entertained Delilah with stories about that evening's performance. So first, Manny forgot his line and then he said, my line, Harper said as she tore into a bag of barbecue potato chips imbecile. I had to think fast, so I kissed him. Was that in character? My character's a bit of a doodle bug, so pretty much anything's in character. Delilah looked at her watch. It was 12.55am. Hey, did you just look at your watch? Harper grabbed Delilah's arm. Give me that! Delilah didn't resist when Harper took off Delilah's watch and stuffed it under a pillow. She didn't need it anyway. She'd know when 1.35am came. No watch, no 1.35am. Harper wiped her hands in a that's that gesture. Delilah wanted it to be that easy, but it wasn't. She knew exactly when 1.35am rolled around. She knew because suddenly a voice said, it's time. 
Delilah jumped up and hit her head on the rack above the bed. What are you doing? Harper asked at the same time Delilah ducked her head under the rack and said, Did you do that? Then they both spoke at the same time again. What do you mean? Delilah said. Do what? Harper said. They both stopped. Delilah could hear, uh, could still hear Gerald's voice in her ear repeating its time in a receding echo. Delilah looked down at Harper. Do you hear that? Harper frowned up at Delilah. I don't hear anything except rules, oldies, music, and the movie Kate and Julia are watching downstairs. You didn't just mimic Gerald? I'm sitting right here in front of you. I'm eating potato chips. How could I have mimicked Gerald? Harper popped a chip into her mouth with deliberate emphasis. She chewed loudly. Delilah shook her head. She realised she was shivering. She had to clench her teeth together to keep them from chattering. Then you must have Ella. What? Delilah's neck was starting to hurt from her contorted position under the closet rack, and her legs felt weak. She sank onto the bed. You know what Gerald sounds like. So? So you could program Ella to sound like him, record yourself mimicking him or something. Harper shoved aside the chips bag and leaned toward Delilah. I want to be sure I'm understanding what you're saying, she narrowed her eyes. You're saying I took your wacky doll and somehow got her to work and I recorded my impression of Gerald on the doll so it could play that for you. That's what you're saying? Delilah shook her head. No? Harper asked. Then what are you saying? That is what I'm saying. I'm just... You're just crazy, is what you're just. I, I don't have the stupid doll. I never saw the stupid doll. If I had seen the doll and had taken the doll, I sure wouldn't have recorded something on it to scare you. Why would I do that? I don't know. Delilah looked at her hands. She felt a little stupid. Why would Harper do that? Then she remembered the voice she heard. But who else could have done it? You tell me, Delilah said. Why did you do it? I didn't do it. Harper shouted. Oh, sorry, I was very confused there. Um, <laughs> Delilah flinched. Then she whispered, but there's no other explanation. Harper stared at Delilah. Jeez, Del, you're losing it. Girl. <laughs> she shoved the junk food off the bed and curled up on her side with her back to Delilah. I'm going to sleep. I wish I could. You could, Harper said. Just get out of your head. It's not me. It's Ella. Harper sighed and started breathing deeply and evenly. Must be nice, Delilah muttered. The next day, Delilah spent most of her day hanging out with Harper and her, ma and her housemates because she didn't fall asleep until almost 7am and Harper woke her up when she got up at about 10am. Delilah was fuzzy with sleep deprivation. She felt like someone had stuffed her brain with cotton candy. When she got up, Harper seemed either to have forgotten Delilah's accusations or forgiven them. She didn't say anything about what happened between them and she was... Uh, she was her usual vivacious uh, self all day. I don't know what that word means. Delilah decided not to say anything else about the Ella. She also decided, though, that she wasn't staying here tonight. She'd leave while Harper was at the theatre. She didn't know until she walked out her car at 4.35pm where she was going to go. It came to her in a flash of brilliant insight. She'd go to a motel, a motel on the other side of the town. Ella wouldn't be able to find her there. Delilah didn't think anyone else, like Harper, would find her there either. She wasn't going to use an assumed name or anything, but Harper didn't process things in the sort of organised way that she'd think she'd, uh, to do a search of motels and find out if her friend was staying there. So at 6.15pm, after Delilah ate a burger and fries at a fast food place, she checked into the bed for you motel on the outskirts of the scuff uh, scruffier side of town. The quality level of the hotel was evident in both its name and the fact that it was a fading sign announced a bed and a TV in every room. Talk about luxury, uh, Delilah said when she parked her cars over her cars, her car over weeds growing through cracks in the time-worn asphalt. The price was right though. Trying not to breathe in smells of bleach and stewed cabbage in the hotel's small brown lobby, Delilah paid for three nights. She was happy that the total barely made a dent in the credit limit on her one credit card. She was also happy that she got a room at the far end of the long, low building in the back away from the traffic. The heavy woman behind the desk wasn't interested in Delilah at all. She was too busy watching a documentary about spiders on an old TV mounted on the wall next to the check-in counter. 
The old hotel room was surprisingly neat and clean. Done in the same ugly brown tones Delilah had found in the lobby, the room wouldn't win any beauty prizes, but it smelled fresh and everything worked. The bed was even comfortable. Because the only other surfaces in the room suitable for sitting were a couple of straight-backed, cloth-covered chairs, Delilah plopped on the bed as soon as she bolted the door and set her stuff on the low bureau across from the bed. Uh, she was pleased to discover the motel was pretty well insulated. The traffic on the busy road in front of the motel was just a distant shh, and Delilah couldn't hear anything else. She thought she might watch some TV when she got in the room, but she was so tired and she risked and she risked lying back on the pillow, tense, expecting the usual panic attack. Uh, a panic attack symptoms. She was thrilled when she felt nothing but exhaustion. She closed her eyes, and sleep took her from the motel room into the promise or portent of her dreams. The sound crept through her sleep like a spider crawling through her synapses and leaving silken trails along her neuropathways. That's such a good sentence. Uh, it was a scuffing sound, like something scooting over a rough surface. Her mind couldn't make sense, uh, make enough sense of it to integrate it into her dream about riding horses. So she, so the horse in her dream threw her off, and she became face to face with the spider. She screamed, and the scream slung her back into consciousness. Delilah's eyes opened, and she realized she was still screaming. She pressed her lips together and bit her tongue. She wanted to get up and run, but she couldn't. She was paralyzed. Wait, was she awake? She thought she was. Above her, something crawled on the roof. It made a similar sound to the one in her dream, but this sound was worse. It wasn't just the sound of some spider going about its business. This was a strategic sound. It started, it stopped, it moved here, it moved there. It was a searching sound, a seeking sound. It was the sound of something with an objective. And Delilah knew she was the objective. Ella had found Delilah. She was looking for a way into the motel room, whining like a kitten being hunted by a coyote. Um, Delilah struggled to free her limbs from whatever force held her immobile. But she was still pinned to the bed. The only thing she could do was move her head. So she turned her head and looked at the digital clock on the bedside table. It read, of course, 1.35am. As soon as Delilah saw the time, she discovered she could move. She thrashed free of the bedspread, which she'd managed to wrap around herself in her sleep. She jumped from the bed and crouched against the wall by the door, she, her gaze riveted on the ceiling. Flashing dark red light from a neon sign next door to the motel splayed across the ceiling like blood splatter. It was sporadically illuminated by the flickering fluorescent lamps that lit up the motel walkways and parking lot. This meant Delilah could see what she needed to see. Nothing was coming through the ceiling, but that didn't comfort her. Ella had other ways to get into the room, and even if she didn't get into the room, the very fact that she was outside of the room on the roof meant that Delilah's brief respite was over. There was no getting away from Ella. Delilah began rocking back and forth like a child, and she hummed until daylight broke. She didn't know what she was humming at first, but then she recognised the tune. She was humming the old lullaby her mum used to sing to her when she was little. Even though Delilah had paid for three nights, she left the motel room about noon the next day. There was no point in staying. She couldn't sleep. She wasn't safe there. She was pretty sure she wasn't safe anywhere, but Delilah... Uh, yeah, but Delilah figured being mobile wasn't a bad idea. This assumed, though, that Ella's circuits hadn't noted the make, model, colour, and maybe even the licence plate of Delilah's car. Ella had, after all, ridden to the apartment in the car. She probably had left some sort of tracker in it. Delilah's travels were no doubt a pointless waste of time and gasoline. But what else could Delilah do? So she drove. She drove all afternoon and all evening. She drove all over the city, exploring neighbourhoods she hadn't known existed. She gazed longingly at big family homes and children playing in the park. She cruised the shopping district, remembering what it was like to be able to buy whatever she wanted, and also remembering how little pleasure that had given her. She'd never wanted things. She'd wanted love. When the sun started going down a little after six, Delilah realised she was being stupid, very stupid. Why was she staying in the city? Why not get out of town, drive out, out onto the country? Wouldn't it be harder for Ella to reach her there? Delilah turned at a busy corner and pointed her car toward the freeway. Then she immediately turned again, looping back into the neighbourhood she'd just left. Maybe she wasn't being stupid after all. What if the city was helping to keep her safe? 
What if Ella would be free to do whatever she wanted to do uh, to Delilah if they were away from a populated area? Besides, in the country it was dark, very dark. Delilah had only one small flashlight. She didn't think she could stand facing 1.35am in the pitch dark. No, she'd stay in town. But where? Pulling into the drive-thru of a fast food burrito place, Delilah bought a chicken and rice burrito with sour cream. Weirdly, even though she was so scared she was probably just one more shock from full-blown hysteria, she still had her appetite. Maybe her body knew she needed nutrition to handle what was coming her way. Delilah ate her burrito at a drive-in movie theater and she discovered, uh, sorry, a movie theater she discovered on the west edge of the city. She had no idea it was there. She was happy to find it though. It had kept her awake until nearly midnight. That's when the last movie, a chase scene heavy action flick, ended and Delilah had to join the ragged line of cars straggling out of the drive-in. That's when she had to decide where she should be when 135 came around. She'd thought about parking her car behind a dark building or in a quiet neighbourhood near an, occupied, an unoccupied house. But did she really want to make it that easy for Ella to get to her? No, it would be better if she was driving around at 1.35am. She'd never tried that before. Maybe that was the trick. No, you're going to crash. <laughs> so as her limbs got more jittery and her breath came faster and her lungs got tighter, Delilah drove closer and closer to the city centre. She wanted to be where people were... Uh, still meandered down the sidewalks and bright lights turned night into day. At 1.33am, Delilah had an even more inspired idea. She'd drive onto one of the big bridges. Surely Ella couldn't get her to her there, especially since the decision to hit the on-ramp onto the bridge was as spontaneous as you could get. Even though it was the middle of the night, at least a dozen cars were on the bridge. Delilah's hands sweated and she repositioned them on the steering wheel. She blinked several times to clear her vision, which was becoming blurry. She concentrated on the road and forced herself not to look at her dashboard digital clock. But she knew when 1.35am arrived. Ooh. <laughs> she knew because that's when she heard her passenger door open, uh, unlock and unlatch. Gasping and losing control of the car for an instant, Delilah turned the wheel to get back in her lane. The whooshing sound of wind coming through the open passenger door hit her just before she heard the passenger door slam closed again. She glanced to her right, her whole body charged with terror. She fully expected to see Ella sitting in the car next to her, but nothing was there. All she saw in the car was a bag of fast food trash, her purse and her flashlight. Almost across the bridge, she put her gaze back on the road. Then something hit the roof of her car with a thunk. Delilah screamed and jammed her foot onto the accelerator. Her car scooted forward and she pulled out to pass a minivan, barely missing its back bumper. She then jerked her car back into the right lane so she could take the first exit off the bridge. Driving like a mad woman, Delilah careened into or onto the industrial road running parallel to the river and pulled over when she reached a boarded up factory. Her car skidded to a stop, spraying gravel. Delilah had the engine off and was out of the car the minute the vehicle stopped moving. She didn't bother to lock it up. She just grabbed her purse and her flashlight, slammed the driver's door behind her and ran. She ran toward the river behind the factory, her feet crackling over crumbling concrete and trash. She ran until she was hidden from the road. Her car was no longer in sight either. Delilah could still see where she was going because the factory, though empty, was well lit. She stopped running and looked around. She had no idea where she was, but she didn't feel safe. Where would she ever feel safe again? Turning in a full circle, she scanned her surroundings. Maybe if she could hide from Ella now, the doll wouldn't find her later. But where could she hide? Delilah spotted a drainage pipe at the far side of the factory. It was huge, maybe four feet in diameter. She could crawl into that easily. Striding across a dirt and gravel lot filled with potholes, Delilah headed toward the drainage pipe, but halfway there she stopped. She couldn't take her purse with her. She couldn't take anything with her. She didn't know what linked her to Ella. Turning into another circle, um, Delilah saw a stack of railroad ties. That should work. She checked her surroundings again. She was still alone. She ran over to the railroad ties and hid her purse in a crevice. Then she looked around once more and bolted over to the drainage pipe. She crawled inside and hunkered down. She realised she was lightheaded. 
She was hyperventilating. Leaning over, her head between her knees, she attempted to shorten her breaths, taking in less oxygen than she was sure she needed. She wished she had a paper bag. There was one in the car, but she couldn't go back there. She couldn't go back to any place she'd ever been before. She couldn't go back to her life. Ella was going to find her anywhere, even here. Delilah fell back onto her butt and curled up in a ball, hugging her legs close. She tried to stay silent, but she couldn't. She began to keen. The sound that came from her wasn't like any sound she'd made before. Not even when her parents died. Not even when her first foster home refused to keep her. Not even when her fourth foster dad beat her. Not even when Gerald scheduled when she could blow her nose. Not even when Richard threw her out. The sound contained every hurt and fear and crushing disappointment she'd ever had. All rolled into one screeching rejection of pain. The sound she made was the sound of a woman who had no strength left. She couldn't fight anymore. Delilah closed her mouth. Her throat hurt. Her lungs hurt. Her heart hurt. And she couldn't stop quaking. Her whole body was almost convulsing with apprehension. No, not apprehension. Delilah was so far beyond any known version of fear that she didn't feel human anymore. She was never going to be safe again. Delilah sobbed as she got onto her hands and knees. She couldn't stay here. Ella would know where she was. Crawling as fast as she could, her hands stinging th from the rough concrete surface, chafing at her skin, Delilah uh, clambered out of the drainage pipe. She stood. Where could she go? Delilah began to run again. She ran parallel to the river, scanning this way and that, looking for a way out, looking for an escape hatch, an ejection seat, something to take her as far from Ella as she could get. She didn't know how long she ran before she stumbled into what looked like an abandoned construction site. Its lumpy outlines were shrouded by the darkness, but street lamps sent enough light over it to reveal its basic outlines. She slowed her pace, aimed her flashlight, and studied the weathered sign announcing the project. It looked like an office complex. Shoving at a dirty board covering an opening in the, wet, uh, in the side of what seemed to be a three-story structure, Delilah side, sidled, or siddled into the, uh, yeah, sidled, uh, sidled into the site. The answer to her plight was in here. She was sure of it. Someplace here, she was going to find a way to escape Ella forever. But where? Picking her way over bare boards, sprinkled with nails and screws, weaving around stacks of lumber and drywall, Delilah made her way into a room that was nearly completed. The drywall wasn't just up, it was also textured and painted, and there, high up on the inside wall, was her answer. It was a vent opening, uncovered, barely big enough for her to slip into. That was the way. That was where she could stop running from Ella. Looking around the room for a way to boost herself in, up into the building, uh, up, up to the opening, she spotted an overturned sawhorse. She trotted over to it, righted it, and carried it to a spot below the vent. It was strong and stable. Stopping to listen, to be sure she was alone, Delilah hoisted herself uh, onto the seahorse, uh, seahorse, onto the sawhorse, stood on her tiptoes and was able to hook her hands over the front of the vent opening. From there, she did a pull-up, thankful for the upper body strength she got from the cl heavy cleaning at the diner. Once her head was level with the vent opening, she reached in with one arm, searching for some kind of handhold. She couldn't find one. Uh, didn't find one, sorry, but her sweaty hand stuck to the metal enough to give her some purchase. She was able to wiggle her upper body into the vent opening by going one hand length at a time. Once she was that far into the vent, she just had to wiggle her whole body like a snake into the vent. But she didn't feel safe. She stopped wriggling for a moment, taking stock. Turning on the flashlight, she spotted a downward turn in the vent. She inched toward it. That Yes, this was it. Aiming her head down the chute-like space, she scooted forward, a little further, and a little further. Her flashlight slipped from her sweaty hand and clinked against the metal vent walls as it dropped out of uh, Delilah's reach. She heard it impact something with a sharp crack. It must have broken because the space went dark. Delilah's shoulders wedged her so tightly into the compact metal enclosure that she knew she'd finally found it. This was where Ella couldn't find her. No one would find her here. Trying to move just to be sure, she confirmed that she was stuck, completely and thoroughly stuck. <laughs> uh, 
her breathing slowed. She relaxed. She couldn't move in any direction. She'd never have to run from Ella again. And there we go. That's 1.35 a.m. <laughs> oh, I, it's, it's, it's an alright story. It's alright. I think it goes on for a bit too long. I think it, it, it just it goes on for, for a bit too long. But um, I think it's, it's still good, nevertheless. I think it's... What's the third story in this book? The New Kid. I think it's like the weakest of the three but it's still pretty good i i quite like this story um it's it, the tension builds and it builds and it builds and it gets worse and worse and just the ending is quite chilling as well uh, i remember first reading through this story and i was like oh my gosh <laughs> that's the end of the story <laughs> it's kind of yeah it's it's weird um but I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I definitely enjoyed uh, this story. Uh, but what did you think? Any theories on what this is about? Um, I will say this comes into play a lot with the Stitch Wraith Stingers. So um, go and read uh, go and read through that chronology if you want to find out how. <laughs> but yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. And I will see you in another audiobook. Goodbye.